Thanks for joining me on the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode features a conversation with Sasha Derry and Seth Lockman of Blue Ship Aerospace, a company based in Brunswick that is working on launch vehicles for small satellites known as CubeSats. As someone who grew up captivated by space and NASA, it was a lot of fun to talk to Sasha and Seth and hear their passion about space and Maine's future in it. I've included quite a few links in the show notes, including how to sign up to watch the live stream of the launch event on October 28th. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Sasha and Seth, if you each want to take a turn and let me know just a little bit about your background, how you got excited about, well, you know, I could say science, but I, I would imagine you can dive in a little deeper too. So Sasha, I'll have you go first. Okay, sure. So, um, you know, I, I, I was really passionate about all things space since I was probably a four or five year old. I remember picking up textbooks when I was a kid you know, showing the astronauts from the Apollo era. And I was born just after that all happened. And so, you know, when, when you're that age and you see all the books, and at that point they had just, you know, all the astronauts had become legends and what NASA had done was legendary. And um, so I think I was part of the generation which had really high expectations of what was to come in the decades uh, later on. And so, uh, you know, I think the other key experience for me was, uh, frankly, living in Maine. Uh, I grew up um, mostly in uh, when I was a, a younger child in Bucksport and Orland area. We had a beautiful view of the universe, uh, especially in the wintertime. So I, I remember kicking back in the in the snowbank and just looking at the stars and the Milky Way. You know that that, that does wonders in terms of sparking a kid's curiosity. So. I really credit a lot of you know growing up in rural Maine uh, with my with my curiosity and uh, for space and the universe. The long windy road kind of gets me through wanting to be uh, going to science uh, and uh, I, you know understand the universe better. For me, there was no better major than uh, physics, so I did that and um, I enjoyed it. I found quantum mechanics extraordinarily difficult. <laughs> <laughs> my husband is teaching that right now, so if oh you want. Goodness. Okay, God bless him. Because, uh, whew, that, uh, that was a point when I had, my intuition could no longer kick in. It was all about math. I later went into, I immediately went into, after graduating from that, I went into electrical engineering. When you get a degree in undergraduate degree, degree in physics, you, you can't get a job. So I went into electrical engineering, which I also really enjoyed. I was a big ham radio enthusiast and enjoyed electronics and creating gadgets, and the like, um, inventing new things. And uh, got that degree and immediately got employed. But then I went into the whole world of like working in the industry, you know, working in telecom. And I started up my first company a few years later in, in the solar world. Again, trying to like connect uh, my curiosity for the world. In this case, you know, this, the world, our world, Earth, and, and trying to seek a way in which, you know, humanity, technology, and benefit can be three things that go together. So a way in which, you know, in this case, renewable energy could benefit our, our home planet, as I like to say. But I'd always, you know, I'd always contain that, you know, that passion for space and that, that wonder for what's out there and what we could become as a race. But at that point, um, I was really discouraged by where we had actually gone since, uh, since I was born in the 70s. You know, space shuttle had gone around the Earth uh, probably several thousand times by that point and the program is about to be shut down. It was just very disappointing. We had done very, very little that even followed my, my dreams as a child of what we could do. No moon base, there was definitely no moon base. Who cares about Mars? We didn't even get the moon base. So, um, so I remember feeling frustrated by that. And I'll have to admit there were certain TV shows that played an element of my, you know, continuing that wonder from Star Trek to Battlestar Galactica. And you know, why are we not there yet? So, um, and then around, you know, the, the mid, you know, around 20, 2009, you know, I think I, I have to give credit to, uh, to SpaceX, Elon Musk, and to, I'd say a year or two later, uh, an organization out in uh, Europe, Copenhagen and suborbitals, mm-hmm. just seeing that almost like do-it-yourselfers, people who decide they want to learn how to make rockets, how to launch things to space can do it. You just have to be dedicated and persistent, and it's hard. Uh, now, of course, if you're a billionaire, that helps out a lot too. 
happen to not be a billionaire. So, but I thought this, this is a moment I, you know, I can make a choice of, of doing this for myself, whether I, whether I'm successful or not, doesn't matter. My, if I've got to let my curiosity take me as far as I can go, as far as my brain capacity can go to, um, to learn new things and develop a new technology. So I basically read a number of uh, textbooks on everything about aerospace, designing rockets, designing engines, space flight. And then I realized that, hey, why has nobody developed a certain type of rocket with a certain type of nozzle to really, one, decrease the cost for launching products, to, launching payloads to space. And uh, everybody seems to be going towards these extreme uh, measures to, to use these exotic fuels or cryogenic oxidizers uh, to get to space. Instead of like building a Formula One, you know, racing engine to space, can you build something that's a little bit more like every day, more like a, I don't know, a Toyota Camry to space, you know, or to sell back to Something that's reliable, smaller, can get to space, and uh, doesn't cost a leg and an arm, or even arm and a leg. So I started up a meetup group. I don't know if you've ever heard of meetup.com. I, yeah, I'm just a few years older than you. So all of these references, I'm right with you. <laughs> okay. So I started a meetup group called uh, Space Flight Innovators in Massachusetts at the time I was living in Massachusetts. I already had this idea of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. But I started this sort of uh, mysterious Space Flight Innovators group and, and invited a bunch of people, whoever would come, to join a team and talk about how can we, how can we get to space. And to my surprise, we had about maybe 25 people over the, in the first meeting. And then, of course, I know how it goes with meetings like this. You, you have 25 people, then it's 20, then it's 15. And, and I was waiting for that, like, juice concentrate of people, the, the really dedicated people. Because what I've learned over time with my own my other business and just working in general is it's persistence that pays off, not just pure passion. You need passion with persistence um, and at least a little bit of knowledge. And I hope a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge. But anyhow, so over the course of several uh, weeks and a few months, they boiled down to sort of a, a few eight people. And they became sort of the core people that became Blue Shift. And I found a Blue Shift in 2014. A uh, few of those folks are with us today at, at Blue Shift, uh, helping us design uh, Stardust and, and what will become Starless Rogue and Red Dwarf. And then, of course, uh, we were drawn to Maine by a, a grant from the Maine Technology Institute, who's been a wonderfully supportive organization. We actually couldn't find support in Massachusetts for aerospace. They told us to probably better to go to Florida or Texas or California or somewhere else. I was really surprised. And at the end of one phone call with a certain state official, they said, you know, hold on a second. You might consider Maine. They're trying to draw technology like that up in Maine too. Give them a call and talk to this you know, organization called MTI. I was like, well, I would love to. I've been trying to get back to Maine for 20 years. So I rang, uh, you know, rang them up and sure enough, they said, yeah, we'll do grants. If your grant proposal you know, flies, you have to move your business to Maine. I said, I would love to move back to Maine. So got the grant, moved to Maine and uh, moved to Tech Place, which is also Tech Place in Brunswick Landing, which is an incredible island of innovation and welcome. You know, they really welcome uh, innovative tech companies here on the Brunswick Landing. Um, a place, something, it's a place that I think is not common uh, anywhere in New England, let alone uh, across the United States, but uh, we're very lucky to have them here. And I, you know, I know they're trying to do something similar up in Loring, up at Limestone. Maine is really developing a kind of a new technology or tech friendly culture. And of course, Maine is a wonderful place to live. I, I love it, even in the winter, I've really grown to love it. Um, I just wanna note one thing, NTI grants are not easy to get. You have to really know your stuff. So I think that actually says a whole lot about the, the, the thought you put into it and the team you put together, because you know it is not like they are throwing money at people who say they wanna be in Maine. You have to kind of prove your worth. And I'm gonna assume that you found that as you applied and talked to them, like they are not, they are not throwing willy, money willy nilly. They really want solid stuff. They really do. And, and uh, it, we were also rejected. So we've had to work really hard. And there's, you know, there's, there's times when we could have really used the funds and we couldn't get it uh, from them. So it's, um, you're absolutely right. You really have to show that you're advancing your company, you're advancing technology, you're advancing your business. 
uh, you're advancing uh, your understanding of your customer base. And they've, they've gotten very savvy on actually assisting companies too, to make sure that you are moving in the forward direction, not just, um, not just kind of spending R and D dollars. And I think for us, it, it was very difficult because, you know, the whole rocket science is hard. It turns out it is a bit hard. And um, there is so much R and D that goes around developing, uh, frankly, the rocket engine, uh, let alone the rest of the spacecraft. They were, they were very patient with us, although it took a lot of convincing for them to understand, look, offside here and what we can develop uh, is, you know, it's a $69 billion market just to launch these small satellites into space uh, in the next 10 years. And if we can just get a droplet of that here in Maine, that means a lot. That means a lot to our small state. So they were very patient. And I think um, the fact there's, you know, there's, you know, we don't work in a vacuum. There's other efforts happening here in Maine, like the Spaceport. Um, there's Vault Enterprises. Uh, there's other organizations which are pushing forward on the aerospace front. And, you know, Maine is not, not a big blip on the aerospace radar right now, nationally. But if we're going to change that, I really think we're going to change it. Seth, I'm going to let you jump in because I know your background is actually quite different from Sasha's. Uh, my, my story is pretty different. Um, I, I was heavily involved in space from an early age. It, it was kind of, uh, I was just kind of saturated in it. Uh, my dad actually, uh, one of his college roommates worked for Dr. Sagan, Carl Sagan. Um, so I grew up very steeped in, in interest in the history of, of space exploration and, and astronomy. And I remember when I was really young, we got a, a home computer that had internet. This is back when internet had a dial tone. And so the first thing I did, I, I just wouldn't stop nagging until I, uh, they, they got me on the NASA website. And I don't know how I did this because I could not read at the time, but I signed my parents up for the press releases from NASA. And every day when there was a mission, they'd get, you know, the crew of the Discovery got, this is their wake up song this morning. And it was all in all caps, I think. And so we got uh, we got those pressers for years, and uh, and we'd read them every every morning. And as the International Space Station started to get built, then it was really, like really every day, and it, it did trickle off at some point. I wonder I wonder how, but I do remember being convinced that I'd kind of seen everything uh, that there was to see on the NASA website, and so I really wanted to go see the Russian website. Of course, at the time, uh, this was like just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so there was no website for the Russian space program, but I did eventually get to visit it. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, I graduated from the main school of science and math in high school. And I actually uh, wound up going liberal arts at the University of Maine. This had an interesting effect because I am of, of uh, the Blue Shifts team, of, of those of us who were born and raised in Maine, which is most of us, I'm the only one that didn't need to leave the state uh, in order to begin supporting myself after college. So I was able to stick around, but of course, how do you get into aerospace with a liberal arts degree? <laughs> uh, well, I started a radio show. Uh, it was called Radio Astronomy, and it, it ran for four years, and it, it's, uh, it still continues, as scientifically speaking, under a new name. And so the show was, was starting to grow, and uh, station management loves it when you can get kind of like a local flavor. This was WMPG out of USM. And uh, so, you know, it's like how, how many space people are in Maine, really. Well, I started to dig and, and actually there's quite a few. And there was, there was this company, I found them on Facebook, you know, this company from up the pike in Brunswick and they're making rockets. And I was like, okay, let's see if we can get this guy for an interview. Took, uh, it, it was like kind of a couple months of back and forth, but we, uh, we finally got him in for, for an interview. It was, it was amazing. We, was, we actually had such a good interview that we did two interviews that, that day. We just kind of kept rolling. I remember pulling Sasha aside and I said, like, I want to be a part of this. What do you need? How can I help? He said, oh, we need somebody to do our social media. I said, I can do that. And uh, so here I am. That's pretty great, actually, that, that both of you do have the different perspectives and, and the different angles. Because what I've noticed, um, Sasha, you're actually really good, I think, at explaining things in what I like to call normal human language. But Seth is also really good at it. And I, I, I think partly the reason Seth's so good at it and it seems to be so easy for him is because... I'm going to guess you've had to do it because you've had to dissect what your engineers are telling you and make it, it goes through your brain and out the other way so that it makes sense for the rest of us who haven't been able to get an aeronautical engineering degree. Oh yeah. I was trying to explain orbits to kids at show and tell 
with the, like the teacher's globe and a toy spaceship. So I've, I've been doing it for, for a while. Um, and that is a, a, a pretty big part of my job. Yeah. So Sasha, you mentioned earlier the payload and, and the designing of the rocket. If you could give just a really quick overview of, of what Blue Shift is and is doing and how it's different from the image that I think almost everybody who's listening to this will have in their head, which is either a Saturn V rocket or the space shuttle or something, you know what I mean? Maybe you could kind of give us a different visual for what it means for you to have a uh, blue shift and rockets in Maine. First and foremost, we're, uh, we're developing uh, dedicated launch vehicles for, launch vehicles is a, is a, a phrase for a rocket. Rockets to take small satellites to space. Now, this is both suborbitally, which means go to space, come back down, and orbitally, so go around the Earth. And um, what we're doing, I think, that's different is a number of things. First and foremost, we are developing really dedicated rockets for small satellites. Right now, if you want to launch a small CubeSat, if any uh, professor, or academic institution, or civil researcher wants to launch a CubeSat, you generally do have to go in those big rockets and you get stuck off in a closet space in the payload area. And you go wherever that payload area is going, you have no choice, no control, no decision. Your batteries die before it ever gets around to launching because it got delayed for two months. Well, you missed out. Before you go any further, you said a really small satellite. What, yeah. So what's that how, size? About as big as this little coffee box. No, it's, a, <laughs> it's 10 centimeters cubed. Um, so that's that's the smallest form factor of a CubeSat. Uh, so that's so almost like a Rubik's Cube, right? It's like a, a little, little, little bigger, bigger yes. Yeah. Might be about, yeah. So um, that's the standard, what's called 1U size. And um, our both our suborbital launch vehicle, which is called Starless Rogue, and our orbital launch vehicle called Red Dwarf will have a payload capacity of about 30 kilograms which means we'll be able to launch about what's referred to as 20U of these. 20U means each one of these is 1U. So you could say, yeah, we could fit 20 of these in there, but most people don't launch just one little satellite. Usually they make them a little, they make them a multiple of this 1U size. So most typical is like a 3U size or a 6U size. It means that there's three or six size 10 by 10 by 10s in there. So it's still smaller than what people probably imagine in their head for satellites, but Far not smaller. anywhere near as large as as kind of what our we have and what we think about. Yes, exactly. So in turn, in turn, our rockets are far smaller than anything you would see in Cape Canaveral. So you know, our, our Starless Rogue uh, will be about thirty feet high. That's the one going suborbitally. It'll be about four feet in diameter. Uh, Red Dwarf, our orbital vehicle. Is will also be four feet in diameter, but it will be about about fifty feet high. Whole idea is that you know our, our rockets will be easily uh, transportable uh, on the back of a tractor trailer. In fact, not only is it easily transportable, but uh, because our our propellants are completely non toxic, uh, there isn't that we need that we don't need a special police escort or extra special hazard conditions uh, in there. And that is probably the the thing I think that. Um, we're the proudest of. I mean, we'll be the proudest of an actual launch to space when that comes up, hopefully within about a year, uh, suborbitally. But I think one of the things that we're we're proud of is is the fact that we can do this with fuels that are really responsible to like the best planet of them all, our home planet Earth. You know, so you know ultimately we will be recovering all of our stages. But if one of our stages hits the water and we can't recover it, the fuel and the oxidizer will not poison the fish. Will not poison okay. the lobsters. This is just beyond cool. If you could kind of just give a quick background of what is usually in that fuel so that people realize just how cool this is, that would be wicked helpful. Sure. Most typically you have a RP-1 or rocket, you know, rocket fuel basically, which is, it's basically a really refined version of kerosene. So imagine dumping thousands upon thousands of gallons into the ocean. You have a mini oil spill. And then just imagine you have a normal rocket launch a normal rocket launch that uh, doesn't come back to Earth or doesn't uh, land safely back to Earth like SpaceX does. Well, there's still a lot of residue fuel that's left in those tanks when it goes to the bottom of the ocean. That is that is going somewhere eventually. And then uh, depending on the rocket, there's different oxidizers used. 
Uh, liquid oxygen, of course, is, is not particularly toxic. It is just cryogenic. So, um, you know, that's dangerous more on the human side when you have to handle it, less so if, it, you know, the rocket um, lands back on Earth. But there are a lot of really, really toxic uh, oxidizers out there that have been used historically. And uh, some of them have been outlawed in the United States, I understand, but still used in countries like China and North Korea. The other really nice thing about our rocket is it really would have a hard time exploding. The fuel, first of all, you could eat it and nothing bad would happen to you. Uh, the fuel is, is not, it has zero TNT value. And if you think about it, that's sort of, un, it's not intuitive that a fuel for a rocket has zero TNT value, but ours does. And that's why, part of the reason why you could safely transport it uh, down the road. But similarly, if it were to break apart, it would be very difficult for the oxidizer and the fuel to combust uh, together. Once they kind of separate and they're, we really have to, um, we really have to work at it to make it combust. Once it combusts, it combusts very well, but it's very difficult to, to do it outside of the combustion chamber. So two so, quick questions. Is, was it the development of this fuel one of the main research and development things that you were trying to explain to MTI that you needed to work on, number one? And number two, all of the test launches that you've been doing, and you have one coming up the second week of October, right? Next week? Uh, uh, hasn't launched uh, anything on purpose yet. <laughs> right, right. I'm sorry, but, but there's the been the tests, tests, right? There's been tests. Yes, yes. What do you are you are you testing that fuel? So those yeah, are the two so questions. Is that the the R and D, and then the the what are what are the test things you're doing? The the first set of uh, the first grant we got from MTI was to help our bio, you know, help our formulation, help us develop our biofuel formulation, and really quantify the performance. So we did about 175 engine tests. Uh, and this was from the heat of the summer through like 14 degrees outside. And I, I, I got to tell you, we learned a lot more than just learning about, um, you know, how effective our fuel was or which formulation worked better. We learned a lot of things that happen to rocket engines when they get really warm uh, and then when they start really cold, you know, and there's there is differences there. And you, you see a number of failures from rockets where they might have developed the rocket engine in Texas or in Florida but they actually have to launch from someplace that's a little bit cold or that night it goes below zero before launch. So we did 175 of those tests. And then, and then we got a grant from NASA, uh, a SBIR grant, continued development of our modular rocket engine. This is a concept where the idea is we, we it's sort of like developing a Model T um, where we just develop one thing and one thing only, and it'll be used for everything going from there on out. So the whole idea is, really want to perfect and create and manufacture one relatively small sized engine that becomes our sort of Lego modular building block for every rocket that we want to build from there on out. And the idea is based upon what we need to do in terms of getting to orbit, we'll snap together different quantities of these modular engines together uh, to achieve the orbit and the payload, the payload to the orbit that we desire. And, um, but it really, you know, imagine having to develop multiple different engines for different stages. Uh, we're able to focus on just developing one engine and hopefully one nozzle. We do hope to integrate an aer what's called an aerospike nozzle into our rocket to make it uh, sort of the ultra in efficiency for launching rockets. So, so we, we've re we successfully wrapped up that NASA R&D grant and we, we um, really uh, were able to well characterize our engine performance to the point where now we feel pretty confident that we can, say we feel very confident that we can launch uh, a rocket up. And the intent, this is probably going beyond where you, you were at, your questions were, but the intent is to demonstrate that this green, truly green rocket fuel and propellant and engine is able to play with the big boys. It, it is competitive with a petroleum based rocket engine of our type and our, our type is a hybrid engine. And the, the concept is uh, we just want to demonstrate that we can inter, inter, we're going to be integrating a number of customer payloads, a commercial customer, two or three academic payloads into our payload area, into our, uh, into our payload fairing, uh, launching it up just a mile, uh, and it'll be parachuting back down to Earth, and uh, hopefully all will go well, and we can deliver these payloads back to the student scientists and our commercial uh, customer who 
it needs to gather some uh, evidence that their uh, product will work well in high vibrate high vibration environments such as a rocket engine. And so all of the tests have to do with a combination. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Their combination <laughs> of testing your fuel and your rocket design and what the rocket's made out of, plus the people who want to do the payload, making sure that they design it so it's able to get finally up to space without being wrecked. The, the first part was research to, to find the optimal formulation of, because we use different bio-based fuels and we were mixing them around, which one, which formulation had that best performance. Okay. And then we got the grant from NASA and that was really to um, optimize, truly optimize the performance of the engine into one single modular engine that we were confident in. And characterizing that engine in a repeatable way was, was hard. And actually one of the hardest things was, frankly, to make the engine stable, uh, to make it combust stably, in addition to making the, well, the, the combustion efficiency really high. We were, because the, the, our fuel is, uh, it's difficult to quantify exactly, exactly which CH chains we're using, uh, because we're using many different ones, really, carbon hydrogen chains. Um, we had we had to guesstimate which what the average CH chains were when we were doing the you know doing the form, doing the calculations on what combustion we would achieve combustion efficiency. So, but by the end of our NASA grant, we were actually achieving efficiencies. I should say actually beyond the NASA grant, we were achieving efficiencies that were beyond what we had theoretically calculated. Now I can tell you, there's no such thing as beating theory. It just means that we our theory was based on numbers that were wrong. It was really exciting to see that we were even beating what we would hope in the very best of scenarios we could do. Seth, did you want to mention something about my, or clarify my misperceptions about what's going on? So your, your question was about like the, the goals of the mission, right? Of, of the Stardust One launch. One coming up. So the first most obvious goal is to safely launch and recover the vehicle. And very close second, safely launch and recover the payloads. And also to demonstrate that there are applications is that there is demand for, for this type of flight, or even maybe a little bit of a higher suborbital hop at our altitudes is kind of generous calling it suborbital. The point is that there are people that they need, you know, a couple seconds of high G, a couple of seconds of microgravity or something close to it. Cause at those heights, there's still air resistance. Maybe they, they need the, the, the vibrations, right? These are conditions that are just sure. You can create them in a lab to some extent, but sometimes a rocket is just the best way to do it. When I had read about or, or seen that you were doing the launch, you know, the test, it never occurred to me that there'd be payload people who would want to also do testing. A lot of people are really surprised by that because it's like, oh, we're only going to 4,000 feet, right? So it's like, oh, so you're not going to space then, are you? Well, never mind that. Actually, uh, there is a, a market. There is a demand for lower altitude launches or, you know, re regardless of the altitude, there's, there's a demand for rocket flights that do not necessarily go to orbit. That's pretty cool. There are uh, suborbital launch companies that they, they only launch balloons. So you don't even, you don't even yeah. make it to space. You can go high up, maybe, uh, maybe 30 miles, but you're still not in space and there's quite a bit of need for that. In some ways, our development of our rocket is, is sort of mirroring what other people are doing on the payload side. They want to prove that, you know, you don't just jump to space. I mean, you can, and there's actually a <laughs> One rocket company is trying to do just that, just kind of skip all the steps and go right to space. But what you do, you know, you usually try to do stepping stones or you try to do trophies. That's the engine. Okay, launch it up so you can recover it safely. Does your guidance work? Does your telemetry work? Okay, launch it a bit higher. All right, add a stage and, and just build incrementally, uh, especially since you, you really want to make it as fault tolerant as possible. So anyways, there, you know, there's payload customers like these academic ones and this commercial one we have where they want to test gosh, well, well, my CubeSat, before I just throw it off of the ISS or, uh, you know, or send up with a rocket off of SpaceX, will it even survive the Gs? Well, you know, will it even work how it expected? Maybe it'll die because so many of the satellites, I think it's something like approaches 50% of CubeSats die before they even make it to orbit from one failure or another. A lot of that comes from, from just, uh, you know, the unexpected experience that the, uh, the, the CubeSat has to go through in the payload fairing as it launches up. So it's a great proving ground that's relatively inexpensive for these uh, researchers to pop in. All right, we have, we're not gonna launch until 2023 or 2022, but let's see if our frame and then the basic electronics boards all strapped together 
will stay together or if, are we going to lose, you know, are the board, the, are the uh, electrical connections going to come loose, you know, or are we going to lose data uh, collection? You know, there's, so there's so many experiments there. So a really basic question, what, what is the vehicle made out of? Sure. It's composite. So um, the lower, the, you know, the lower two thirds is carbon fiber. Um, our payload fairing is, uh, is fiberglass. And the, the point for that is you need to be radio frequency. You need to be transparent to radio waves, RF transparent, because that's where all our, our tel telemetry is located and we need to be able to communicate back down the ground. So whereas carbon fiber, because it's conductive, is a bit like, a, well, it's like a gigantic shield, you know, so it prevents, it prevents electromagnetic radiation from exiting or entering. So you can't communicate with the outside world. And do you make all of that, right? Or do you? You're right, right in the midst of that right now. We're really fortunate because, you know, they're a tech place. They have a composite layup facility. Uh, they have yeah, a very crazy. large, they have a very large uh, composite oven. These are things that we'd have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on that we don't have to, which we're so fortunate to have there. And it really saves our costs so that we can do this for less and do it here in Maine. It's almost like a co-working space at a business level that people yes. provide different expertise and, and equipment that other people can use. It's, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's great because we, you know, we, we needed a welder and uh, we just we walked down the aisle and I uh, was able to find a company that normally do marine stuff. And they're lending us borrow their welder for a few days to help us weld together our launch rail system. We're very fortunate. Yeah. And that, that same company might help us out uh, down the road with a very interesting launch platform that we can't talk about much right at this point, but it's going to be a, a potentially a key way for us to really lower the cost for launching to space. All right, so this launch that's coming up, I'm sorry, you, I know you mentioned the name of it and I can't, I want to say Stardust, but that doesn't yep. seem right. Oh, that's it is. Right. Yeah, the yeah. Stardust is coming up and I know that people can watch it because I've already signed up, but I'm going to let you <laughs> tell people how to do it because I definitely don't remember. Yeah, so we're in the process of uh, setting up a YouTube live stream. And if, if folks go to our Eventbrite page for the event, uh, they can sign up there and we'll place a link there uh, as well as all over social uh, when we're ready to go live. And do you both get to go right where the launch is? Oh, yeah. Do you, you both Definitely. get to be there? And I can't remember where, is it in Limestone? Sure yeah. is, yeah. And is that where, where most of your tests have been? No. No, they've mostly been here at Brunswick Landing. So why Limestone this time? So, you know, one of the challenges is launching big rockets, or <laughs> it's big for us, um, <laughs> is uh, you, uh, you need a, a good safety zone. You need a good perimeter where you won't hit people <laughs> or property or buildings. And that is the beauty of a long, long runway that was for the B-52 bombers. That decommissioned Air Force Base is a bit of a godsend because it has such a long open area where we can, we can launch from. And I'd have to say, you know, we looked at some other sites here in Maine, um, and there are other sites that are a little bit inland that could work pretty well. But the folks at Loring uh, Commerce Center really welcomed, you know, very similar to Brunswick Landing folks, the MRA folks and Tech Place, really welcomed us with open arms. They really want to see this industry take a hold uh, up there in Limestone as well. And like I say, Seth and I went up there, uh, Seth went to school up there, as you, you probably heard. I find it really beautiful. Uh, all my extended family lives out in Ohio. It reminds me of like Ohio uh, farmland up there, just a little bit hillier. And uh, we, we went up right when they, you know, it was uh, potato picking season. You see the machines going through and it was reminding me a lot of, of that area of that neck of the woods of the Midwest. So I, I thought it was really beautiful. Of course, the leaves were all turning. And that was before it was, they were turning down here in Southern Maine. And you just see, you see that that Air Force Base or the former Air Force Base, there's so much potential. There's so many uh, buildings that are going unused that, you know, really could host some interesting businesses. So I think they're, they really want the world to know that they're open for business up there. And it's, I think it's, it's a beautiful, gorgeous place. I never knew, I'd never been that far north of Maine. And I never knew how, how gorgeous it is up there. I love the fact that what you're doing got you and many other people back home to Maine and allowed Seth not to leave. But more importantly, <laughs> to destroy this idea of two Maines, um, I, I think it's a really great way to show that all parts of the state have different things to offer and different expertise and, and different opportunities. So, 
Well, I think this is really exciting. What is the date again of the launch? I'm sorry. And, and I will include in the show notes, but the date of the launch. It is uh, tentatively October 21st. As rocket launches do go, they tend to slip. Uh, we're doing this on an incredibly short time scale, uh, even for us. So we have a lot to do. And we want to do, we want to do a static test with the engine, uh, the rocket fully assembled and on the launch rail, but you know, cl- clearly clamped down uh, before we bring it up to limestone and attempt to launch it again. So we have a lot to do, but we also know that winter's coming. And currently they don't normally plow the runway at Loring during the winter. So once once the snow hits, we're, we won't say we'll be locked out, but it, it'll be very difficult. So we really want to get there before the snow drops. So one last question while I'm thinking of it. You said you've got the different customers for the payload. Where do they come from? I mean, I know you said corporate and business and academic, but is it, I'm going to, I'm going to guess it's not just Maine. So we, there's a, one of our potential investors is uh, reaching out to um, students near, uh, in their town, which is Houston, Texas. And, but the other, all the other int- uh, folks who have expressed interest are in Maine. We've worked with the Maine Space Grant Consortium, which has also been supportive of our efforts to get the word out that we have payload, you know, payload area that's available for academic purposes. And actually quite uh, just, just, just moments before I met, um, you know, we had this podcast, I just delivered our first 3U CubeSat enclosure to students at the Falmouth High School. So they're actually very, they're very literally the first one to get our enclosure. So they, they have an enclosure, everyone's gonna get an enclosure, they'll integrate their CubeSat into it, and then hopefully deliver, deliver to us a few days prior to the launch, uh, and then we'll be integrated into the payload area a few hours before launch. I was clearly wrong in my assumption. What this means is that main organizations and companies have access to something that would be unattainable, not just because of how far away they are in distance, but by how do they even reach out to those companies and have it, have their ear? Does that does that make sense? And and I think that's uh, you know that's the great thing about you know uh, radio shows or podcasts like your own. You can get the word out. I would personally love it to see that, you know, we still have a little bit of room left over in our payload area. I would love to see, you know, students from Bucksport or Orland, Maine, or heck, Limestone or Presque Isle or Cutler. You know, I'd love to see students from somewhere, somewhere where we're not getting a lot of math and science students um, normally. I like to see, I think, but I know there's a lot of passion. I was one of them. Uh, there's the students out there working with their science teachers to develop their own payloads and coming up with something innovative and fun. Uh, you know, I know it's a very short time frame, but I would love it if they, they could come up with something. We can get it beyond the Cumberland County area. Who can they contact about how to do that and what would be a good payload? What's, how can we make this happen? Probably the best way to reach us is probably through the, uh, the marketing email address, marketing at Blue Shift Aerospace and Blue doesn't have a e, an E, so B-L-U. S-H-I-F-T, aerospace.com. Does that sound good, Seth? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and we're also on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And so I, uh, I check those regularly. If I may, a lot of times when I, when I start talking to somebody new about what we're doing, I just kind of start a clock running in my head and wait for the word crazy to come up. You know, it's, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> and sure, it sounds crazy. A lot of people don't know that We've got 52 aerospace companies in the state already, two of which are are rocket companies. We've got amazing aerospace programs at the University of Southern Maine and the University of Maine in Orono. We've got kids who are are really prepared for STEM careers coming out of the Maine School of Science and Math. We have a ton of Cold War infrastructure. We've got uh, a naval base in Brunswick, an Air Force base in Loring. uh, We we have a, a lot of stuff that's in place already. What we're doing, it's a lot of hard work, yeah but it's not such a huge leap. Um, you know, we already have the perfect geography for launching into a polar orbit. We already have an aerospace business incubator. Tech Place is an incubator for <laughs> aerospace startups. This is amazing stuff. And I, I want everybody to, to know about it. This is not a huge leap for mankind. I, I'll put one other thing too out yes. there is that, you know, especially as, I want to see people have curiosity in science. Boys and girls, you know, pursue that, and not be, not be, uh, not be brought down by the friction that maybe their school system doesn't necessarily support it or doesn't have the funds to support it well. And let them know that you know there are um, 
there are grants out there from the Maine Space Grant Consortium, for instance, to provide internships, summer internships with companies like our own so that they can learn, I'll help us out, but also learn during the summer. And it's a great way to combine developing Maine students and uh, of course, assisting out Maine aerospace companies. Are those for high school students and college or just high school, both? Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I don't wanna take any more of your time. Um, I, could, I could really go for hours. I, I love this stuff. <laughs> I find your work really inspiring for a whole host of reasons. I love the fact that you're, you're trying to use a fuel that is uh, safe, isn't the right word, but uh, non-impact, I think, is actually really, really great. And the fact that it sounds like you've done that from the beginning, I think, shows that if you look at things from just a slightly different angle, you can do all sorts of really creative things. So thank you both for letting me take up your time and talk about space and Maine. And I cannot wait to watch the launch. Thank you Thanks, so much. Kate. Really appreciate your time. The Maine Science Podcast has received support from the Maine Technology Institute and is recorded at Discovery Studios in Bangor, Maine at the Maine Discovery Museum. The Maine Science Podcast is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. I received production support from Miranda Bouchard and the Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.